after the two horses which pulled the chariot of Mars, the god of war, in Roman and Greek mythology. And he was astonished on the first night to uh, see the innermost moon in one position and then uh, see the innermost moon in one position and the next night to see it in quite a different position. And he couldn't figure out what was happening in putting together the observations on successive nights. And the reason for that problem is that Phobos, the innermost moon, is an extraordinary object doing an extraordinary kind of motion, which we will try to duplicate here. Here we have a model of Mars and protruding on two metal pipes are two gray covered spheres which represent Phobos and Deimos. Phobos at about the right distance from Mars, but Deimos would have to be somewhere out to here and would collide with the telescope and me and various things, so we've made it closer to the planet. Now, here we have the moons going around roughly at the right speed and Mars going around at roughly the right speed. And what do we see? We see that Phobos, the innermost moon, goes around Mars faster than Mars itself turns. Now, on the Earth, we're accustomed to objects rising in the east and setting in the west. Why do they do that? Because the Earth is turning from west to east. But on Mars, you would see something extraordinary. Since Phobos goes around faster than Mars does, Phobos would rise in the west and set in the east. And it would do it very fast. In fact, there are many times on Mars, if you live near the equator, when you could see Phobos rising in the west uh, at uh, sunset, it would then set and then rise again before dawn. You could see it rise, set, and rise. But only if you lived near the equator, because if you live near the pole, you can't see it. Mars is in the way because it's so close to Mars. Now let me see if I can stop the moons from revolving. That's very difficult. But now, the discovery of these two moons, first Phobos and then Deimos, uh, was announced. It was thought to be important. Here is a uh, reproduction of uh, a page of the London Times for uh, Tuesday, September 4th, 1877. And there, beneath a large map on the progress of the Bulgarian War, is a uh, small article sent by telegraph on the satellites of Mars saying that uh, the observations that were made in Washington had been confirmed at the Paris Observatory, making them reliable. Now, the moons of Mars are too small to see with even such a telescope. All you can make out is a point of light. You cannot make out in the extended disk. They're tiny objects. So people interested in studying the moons, what could they do? More or less, the only thing of interest was to observe the motion. And so this was done. And when the motion was observed, a strange thing was discovered. It was found by precision observations that the orbit that Phobos followed was not a perfect circle. It was instead something like a very faint spiral. The planet was, the moon was slowly approaching the planet. And you can calculate at the present rate that Phobos approaches Mars when it will collide which, with Mars, and that will be in about a hundred million years. We've got to stop it so it doesn't do it sooner than that. Now, a hundred million years is far into the future, but still is short compared to the age of Mars in the solar system, which is about four and a half American billions of years. And uh, it's an interesting thought that Phobos will plummet into Mars and collide with it in the relatively near future, at least on the geological timescale. 
and suggests that other moons of Mars and other planets may have collided with them earlier in their history, and that great basins formed by such impacts might exist on the planets. That's a topic for a later discussion as well. Now, why does Phobos have this strange spiraling motion? The Soviet astronomer I.S. Shklovsky is an extremely clever and creative uh, astrophysicist, one of the best in the world, and he considered this question in around the year 1960. And he thought of all sorts of reasons it might do this, make this motion, calculated what would be required, and concluded that it couldn't happen. He then returned to the idea that Phobos was spiraling in for the same reason that artificial satellites in the Earth's atmosphere spiral in, because of drag by the thin atmosphere of Earth or Mars in the appropriate case. But Phobos is not a very uh, large object, but we have a rough idea how big it was, and Shklovsky thought it was maybe 10 or 20 kilometers across. That's a very massive object. It's very far from Mars, so the atmosphere there must be very thin. How could that thin atmosphere slow down, drag, this massive satellite? Well, the only solution Shklovsky decided was that the satellite wasn't as massive as we had thought, and the only way to have that is to have Phobos hollow. Shklovsky proposed that Phobos was an immense object 10 or 20 kilometers across, which was empty on the inside. He correctly pointed out that no natural object can be hollow in that way, from which he concluded that it was not a natural object. He proposed that Phobos was an artificial satellite of immense proportions orbiting Mars. The biggest artificial satellite that we've managed is about the size of this auditorium, and therefore to make one the size of the inner city of London would require some civilization much more advanced than we are. And uh, since there is no sign of such a civilization on Mars today, Shklovsky proposed that there once was such a civilization, but that it is now extinct. Now, that's a chain of argument which may remind you of some of the arguments of Percival Lowell, but notice that it's based upon observations that are at least real. Phobos does have that kind of spiral motion. Well, as a result, it would be very nice to take a close-up look at Phobos. What would an enormous artificial satellite 10 or 20 kilometers across look like? Right? That's something we surely like to know. And if it's not an artificial satellite, well, we could certainly find that out as well by examining close-up pictures of Phobos. Our first opportunity to do this came in 1971 when the United States put into orbit around Mars a spacecraft called Mariner 9. It was the first space vehicle to orbit another planet. It arrived in the midst of a great planet-girdling dust storm. There was essentially nothing whatever to be seen on Mars. I had previously proposed to uh, the management of this mission that we should plan on looking at Phobos and Deimos, but uh, they had a big book and they looked in this book and said, nowhere in this book does it say anything about looking at Phobos and Deimos, so you can't look. And uh, I thought about that a little bit, and then went back and said, the most likely origin of Phobos and Deimos is that they are captured asteroids. If we look at Phobos and Deimos, we then won't have to go to the asteroid belt, and we could save $200 million if you let us look. They said that that was a much more reasonable argument than the last one, <laughs> and said, maybe we could look. And then when we arrived at Mars and found there was nothing to be seen on Mars, they said, by all means, look, how nice of you to think of this. So we looked. And in late November of 1971, we obtained our first close-up view of Phobos, and it looked like this. Now. Not much to see, right? But this is before.